Hello everyone, this is Kave calling you from Honolulu, Hawaii, and this is lesson three of our Common Bliss tutorials. So I'm doing this back to back with lesson two, so we still have our spiral on the screen and everything, and obviously I have not yet uh, gotten any feedback on lesson two. When I do that, I will address those comments if they appear. So um, lesson three is talking about transforms and transformations in the computer graphics sense of the word. Um, so we start off by just defining a linear interpolation function which simply um, takes a factor f, a low value and a high value, and interpolates between them. And then we add two methods to our point class uh, for multiplication, so p star. And the thing to notice here is that we have two versions of it and they have different signatures. So these are multi-methods and common, lo common list logic system, CLOS, does multiple dispatch on methods, which is very, very useful. So if both arguments are points, this method gets called. If a second argument is a number of some kind, this method gets called. So I can just illustrate that simply by saying multiply the point one two for example by the point three four and we get the point three eight which is the correct number and then if our second value is a number like just say 12 instead of being a point we get 12 being multiplied by one and by two so that's doing the correct thing um, a method to compute the magnitude, length of a point, and a distance between two points. So very straightforward. Now here we have um, they warned me earlier, that's why I have an underline here, but it's not important. Um, we define a new class called a transform. And the transform contains a translate, rotate, and scale. And these guys have values of zero vectors for the translate and scale, and just the scalar value for the rotate. In 2D, you only have one rotation value. And um, we want to make sure that the rotation value is always a single float, because we pass that to OpenGL. So we do the same kind of coercion that we did earlier with our points. And then we define. Uh, functions for translate by a point which basically updates the translate of the transform by adding it to the current translate. Uh, rotate does the same thing and then scale does the same thing but scale does the same thing um, since it's a point multiply it takes two methods and has different signatures so you can either scale it by a point if you want to scale in non-uniformly or in x and y, or you can scale by a single number that will scale uniformly in x and y. It's just a convenience for us, so we don't have to keep saying scale by 0.22, we just say scale by 2. Um, reset transform simply sets everything back to the original values. And um, print object basically uh, lets us do the same thing we did before with our points, which is print some more, more uh, useful information. So for example, if I say def parameter trans so here it's using our print object to print some in interestingly useful information for us in this case. Now, um, let's define a polygonal shape and let's inspect it. Now, I'm continuing the current session from last time so we had defined our shape class um, that basically 
didn't really have anything in it. Uh, it was just an empty class. So if I go back to lesson one, so our shape class over here, I should find it. There we go. It was basically an empty class. And then the polygonal shape class inherited from that. So now what we've done is we have redefined the shape class by adding a slot to it. And this is something that's very powerful that you can do in Common Lisp, which is basically the idea of working in Common Lisp is you're working in a, um, in a live setting where you have your environment and your world and your software, and it's all running, and you can modify anything you want through the REPL. So the REPL in Common Lisp is very powerful. It's more powerful than some other languages where you're not allowed to redefine classes or methods or add methods um, while the REPL is running. In Common Lisp, the REPL has all the power of the language um, in it. So it's not some subset of the language that you can use. So this, combined with the other features of Lisp, make it very good for interactive programming. Just to show what I mean by that is, so here's a transform that is added to our class, um, our polygonal shape class. So if I go here now, and I basically oops, this is why I don't really live code, I'm not very good at typing. I redefine the shape class to take out the transform. And if I go to my inspector and I refresh it, the transform is gone. If I put the transform back in, refresh it, the transform is there. So the fact that you can basically modify your classes on the fly while you're in your interactive session and in your REPL is a very useful and powerful thing to do. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point that out, that it's one of the ways that Lisp um, really provides a very interactive way of developing software. You can kind of like, you know, define classes in your world as you're alive in your REPL. You don't have to stop and exit everything and reload a new file and um, so on. So everything is meant to basically let you work continuously. Um, so we define some utility methods here. So you can say translate by transform of shape, but that gets tedious. We just want to, be able to translate the shape itself. So we basically have some methods that simply pass their arguments and they call the appropriate function on the transform directly. And even reset transform, instead of saying reset transform of transform of shape, you just want to say reset transform of shape. Because it's something that we do very commonly. Now, I'm going to introduce a new idea here. Two new ideas. One is how transformations work with transformation matrices. And the other one is basically these before and after methods. Let's start with transformation matrices. So the way we think of transforms in computer graphics, I don't want to get too in-depth in this because this is not really a CG lesson, is we compute a transformation matrix for the transform based on the translate, rotate, and scale values that it has. And in the case of 2D graphics, it's a 2D, 2 by 2 um, matrix. And in the case of 3D graphics, it's a 4 by 4 matrix. And then all the points that go through the geometry pipeline get multiplied by that matrix. So the way OpenGL OpenGL's API works is you say, push a matrix, then give it the translate rotate and scale values. And now anything that gets drawn will be transformed by those values. And then after we're done, you call pop matrix. So that matrix gets popped off the matrix stack and you carry on on your merry way. So to complicate that further, I've decided to use a particular feature of common list logic system, CLOS, to do this. So basically anytime we want to draw a shape, the first thing we want to do is push a matrix and call the OpenGL translate, rotate, and scale functions, update the current matrix, 
And every time we're done after we're drawing, we want to pop the matrix because we're done with that particular matrix. So Common Lisp Optic System provides um, method combinations. So most optic systems basically just let you have a method, you know, like a draw method. And then from that draw method, if you want to, you can call this parents draw method or the superclasses draw method by saying, you know, call next method or something of that sort. Common Lisp provides a lot more than that. So there's a whole method combination scheme where if I give a method the before keyword, that means this gets executed before the main draw method. So what happens is basically all the before methods get called, then the most specific main method gets called, and then all the after methods get called. So in our case, what happens is basically when we call draw a shape, it'll first call the draw before method and update our transformation matrix. And then it'll do the actual drawing by calling the draw method on polygonal shape. And then it'll call the after method on shape and pop the matrix. So I'm probably not explaining this very well, but you know we'll see a little bit more of it um, a little later. So if we uh, want to do this, let me just create a shape. And basically, so we, this is our square. We've seen it before. But now if I say with redraw, translate the square by 0 0.05, 0 0.01, you can see it's moving. And every time I recompile the expression, it's moving. And if I want to rotate it by five degrees each time, I can do that. And if I want to scale it uniformly, I just call it with one number. And if I want to scale it non-uniformly, I call it with point, with different values. And then if I want to reset the transform, I just say reset transform on the square. So the method combination that's called is basically the draw method of the shape class, the before method is get, gets called. Then the polygonal shape draw class gets called. Then the shape draw after method gets called. And what's interesting about this and so useful about this is that now any subclass of polygonal shape or any subclass of shape automatically benefits from this before and after method execution. And I don't have to ever worry about any of my other classes explicitly calling push and pop matrix um, in OpenGL. A little more elaborate explanation. If I also had before and after methods on my polygonal shape, they would get called around the before and after of the shape. So it's like basically everything else gets sandwiched in between them. So you start off with your most specific draw method, your most specific before method, then all the other before methods that are defined in the class hierarchy, then the most specific draw method, then in reverse order, all the after methods. So I hope this is kind of clear. It's a bit of a rushed explanation, um, but uh, I, I, you know, hopefully this will be um, clear. And then I also define this macro here, which basically is for scene shapes. And I loop through all the function, all the scenes, all the, excuse me, all the shapes in the scene. And I call the function that's specified on them. Now, Let me skip ahead a little bit here because I, okay. I'm gonna skip it here because I rearranged some of these lessons so that particular class marker shape is not defined yet. But, so here are 10 hexagons we loop through from I to 10 or I from zero to nine. Um, we have a factor, we create a hexagon shape, 
we create a scale number, which is basically linear interpolation of the factor from 0.1 to 1.5. And then we scale the hexagon by that number. We rotate the hexagon by interpolation between 0 and 90. And then we add the shape to the scene. So each shape has a different scale value and a different rotation value. And that gives us this particular design. So if we make a rotation, excuse me, a row of shapes. So what we do is we're just doing the same thing, 10 shapes. So there are basically nine uh, gaps between them. We create a hexagon shape with a diameter of 0.2, so it's smaller. And then we translate it by a linear interpolation between minus 0.9 and plus 0.9 and x. And the y value just stays 0. And that gives us a row of 10 hexagons. And now we use our four scene shapes macro that automatically knows about the scene variable and the global scene uh, variable. And what we're going to do is basically randomly move the shapes in Y. So for each of the shapes in the scene, translate the shape by 0 and X and a random value between minus 0.1 and plus 0.1 in Y. So you can see that they just kind of like wobble up and down. Same idea using that 14 shapes macro, where basically we rotate by some random value between minus 10 and plus 10. So if you can see they're rotating as I keep evaluating this. And then to scale them, So they get scaled by a value between 0.8 and 1.2. And then if I reset all their transforms, they will all pop back to the origin where they are initially. So what's important to realize about transforms is they don't actually modify the point values of the shapes. They're basically a value that gets pushed into a matrix stack and all the points get multiplied by the, that matrix as they get transformed onto the screen coordinates by OpenGL. So it's much more efficient than having to loop through all the points and add values to them and rotate them and so on um, ourselves. And uh, we'll see more of what we can do with transforms in our next lesson. So thank you very much.